it's fun to be back with everybody. And I thought um, we might do something a little bit different or maybe back to a little bit more normal since I think most of us have spent so much time on webinars trying to get prepared to go back into practice. Um, and so Carrie's risk assessment in our practices is actually something I've been pretty passionate about for the last decade at least probably the whole time I've been a dentist because we pay attention to this right from the beginning. But you know, when I went back into full-time practice in um, 2011, this really just hit my radar screen in a different way. And I think that's part of because of the type of practice that I purchased when I did and my patient demographic. And you know, I think for most of us, when we think about assessing Carrie's risk, we the first our first response is, I know how to do that. Absolutely. I think for most of us, it's one of the very first things that we learn in dental school is the idea of diagnosing caries, diagnosing perio. It's all the way, way at the beginning. Um, and even though when we're in school, um, it's a learned process and we have to think about it, you have a caries risk assessment protocol that my guess is you do in a nanosecond without even really thinking about all of the different factors. It's so routine. It's such a part of your thought process that you, don't, you couldn't even divide out the separate pieces you think about. Now that may or may not be completely true for the rest of your team. You know, and so it's always interesting to me when I get to spend time with hygienists or assistants or dental team members that a lot of the stuff that as the dentist we do, they don't necessarily have the background information and they couldn't actually clearly say, why do we watch this cavity? Why do we fill this cavity? Um, and by the way, I put that in quotes because I honestly don't like the word watch because to me, if I was a patient, my question would be, what are you watching it do? And we kind of all know the answer to that is we're watching it get worse until we have to recommend filling it or treating the tooth. Um, and so, you know, there's got to be better language. And I'm not saying I have a perfect solution to that, but that word always just strikes me poorly when we say we're watching things. And, you know, so this is who I was. I went back into practice. I had a caries risk uh, protocol that was up here in my brain. And it was so smooth that I couldn't, I didn't even, you know, lay it out on a piece of paper. But what struck me about it, because I was out of full-time dental practice for almost a decade while I was teaching the first time at Penke and then at Spear. And I really, I think I expected when I went back into practice that I would have seen less caries in my patients after a 10 year gap, that we might've gotten better at prevention. We might've gotten better at helping our patients with this. Um, and instead I have to actually tell you, I saw more caries. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, I went to the University of Florida College of Dentistry. And when I was at school in Florida in the 1980s, the CDC, which we're all talking about today, but on a non-infection control topic, actually released a study, an epidemiologic study. And they actually predicted that if we stayed on the path we were on in the 1980s, we would see the end of dental decay in the United States in the next three decades. They released that study in 1986. We're way more than 30 years past that. And I don't know about any of you, but I actually do believe I see as much or more caries in my practice today than I did when I graduated from dental school in the 1980s. Now, it's not necessarily the same population of patients, but we haven't gotten a handle on it. Now, you could stop and say, why did the CDC predict that? What is, how confident can we be in the CDC after giving that one? Well, you have to think about epidemiological studies look at trend lines. And you know, in the 1980s, we'd finally gotten fluoride in every public water supply. Um, we had um, give, you know, healthy smiles programs in, in kindergarten and pre-K in every state in the union. Um, we were doing sealants, you know, our, the rate of people coming to the dentist was going up. We had fluoride in over-the-counter toothpaste. I mean, they were just looking at trends and they were predicting if all of this keeps up, what's, what's, what are things gonna look like in the next 30 years? Well, we have to kind of give the CDC a smidge of a pass 
because in that next 30 years after they released that study, our lives changed dramatically, right? And you have to think about our life expectancy and how long we're living and the fact that um, the just like everything else, the longer we live, there are things you have to deal with physiologically. And one of those happens to be increased caries risk. Um, dietary changes, you know, in the 1980s, um, we didn't have Starbucks, not Ding and Starbucks, my favorite place on the planet. I personally support them. Um, but when we think about that and the way we eat today versus the way we ate in the, ate in the 1980s, um, you know, the medications, there's so many things that changed not to mention we reversed some of those trends. Now we're taking fluoride out of the public water supply. We have a reinvigoration of patients being suspicious about fluoride. So all of these things go together. So when I said, I need to learn more about this, I actually need to see if what I know is current. I came across something called CAMBRA, which stands for Caries Management by Risk Assessment. So the CAMBRA protocol was actually developed by Dr. Doug Young out of the University of Pacific in San Francisco. And it was first adopted by the California Dental Association as sort of the standard for caries risk assessment. Then the American Dental Association said, yep, this is the standard of care for caries risk assessment. If you have not looked at an actual CAMBRA form, I highly recommend that you do it. The one on your screen, I know you can't read all the type, um, but that's the one from the ADA. And if you're a member of your state dental association, you're arbitrarily a member of the ADA. And you can go to the ADA's website, and if you don't already have login credentials, create them, and then you can download their Canberra forms. And there's two. There's a pediatric form, which is age zero to seven, and then there's the adult form, which is eight and up. Not sure when eight-year-olds became adults, but just go with it. Okay, um, and you're gonna look at those two different forms. And again, I would tell you when I first did this, I pulled the form up thinking, I'm gonna already know all of this, but you know, I'll just be a good rule follower and I'll see what's on the form. Reviewing the form, and for me, actually reviewing the form in a team meeting with my assistants and my hygiene team was probably one of the best things we've ever done in our practice around helping our patients because some of the things you know intuitively, you're gonna actually learn new information about by going through the form. And so intuitively, I know if a patient gets cavities more frequently than another patient, they probably have higher caries risk. But on the form, it literally specifies, if you've had a caries lesion in the prior 36 months, you cannot be in a low risk category. You automatically pop to moderate or high risk. And so the frequency with which they have recently had a carious lesion, there's actually a mathematical piece of that equation instead of just using your intuition. There's also things on the form that truthfully for us were not top of mind. And so going through it and reviewing it and really thinking about, do we ask our patients these questions? So one of the things on the form is asking whether or not the patient uses any fixed or removable dental appliances. And so when we think about fixed or removable dental appliances, the first place my head goes is ortho. So absolutely, you know what? The instant we put brackets and wires on a patient's teeth, I believe their caries risk just went up. And I think we all kind of would say the same thing that their caries risk goes up because home care is much more difficult. And as you can't brush and floss, we know what the decay looks like. If they have brackets, they get decalcification in a little circle around the bracket where they can't clean away the food particles in the plaque. I'm old enough, I had bands, so you have the white lines. But this is fixed or removable. And I thought that was really interesting. So I did some more research and it turns out that, you know, Invisalign trays or any kind of clear aligner increases the patient's caries risk. It doesn't do it because it impedes home care. It does it because it traps a potentially acidic oral environment between the tray and the teeth, and that starts the process of decalcification. And one of the big things we've learned in the 30 plus years since I was in dental school is that the biggest physiologic risk factor for caries is an acidic oral pH. If your oral environment is acidic, you're at much higher caries risk than other patients. Now, if our salivary glands are working properly, even in the face of an acidic diet, our saliva should be able to buffer our oral environment. 
but pH is the primary thing that we look at, way more than quantity of s mutans. So as a matter of fact, we don't actually even truthfully test today for the actual number of bacteria of s mutans. We also don't use Carrie's tests today that test for acetylcholine, which is a byproduct of s mutans metabolism, because there is not a one-to-one -one correlation between quantity of s mutans and Carrie's risk. There is absolutely a one-to-one -one correlation between oral pH and the buffering capacity of your saliva and your caries risk. So if you have patients in clear aligner therapy, how about mandibular advancement devices? How about talking to a panky group? How about um, occlusal appliances all night long? Essex retainers. You know, I think about my patients who are in the midst of implant dentistry, and I have female patients who wear an Essex retainer literally 24 hours a day. They won't even go to sleep at night without their Essex in because they don't want their husband to see them without that missing tooth. And if they also have decreased buffering capacity of their saliva, that is really gonna elevate their caries risk. So we wanna think about all of those things. The form will clarify that and help you with that. Um, you know, one of the things the form talks about is medications. There's a lot of medications that patients take that increase their caries risk. Unfortunately, this isn't, isn't really listed at the top of medication side effects, but any medication that has as a side effect dry mouth, so it decreases the quality or the quantity of the patient's saliva, also increases their caries risk because it is the buffering capacity of the saliva that helps protect the tooth structures from caries. So we have to look at those things and ask our patients about all of those, those potential impacts. So what I did with this form, I don't actually use this form the way it looks because it kind of reminds me of a, a very bureaucratic government form. I actually took the questions on this form. I created a Word document that has my logo at the top. I have the questions there that I know the patient will know about themselves. And then below there's a line and it says to be completed with the help of your hygienist. And then there's the questions that I know the patient won't necessarily know by themselves. And so I'll give you an example of that. One of the questions on the form is whether or not the, the patient has previous restorative dentistry with ill-fitting marginal integrity. I'm really clear my patients don't even know what that ask, is asking, much less do they know the answer to that question. So on the form I give my patients, the question says, I have old fillings and crowns that no longer seal my teeth well, yes or no. And I actually love doing this the way we do it where we, we and I, I don't know how I'll do this next week, don't ask me that question, but before COVID-19, we used to have this form on a clipboard with their med history update and all of the other papers that we did. And we would have the patient fill out their section and then we would fill out the bottom section with them. And, you know, I love when I hear a patient and they're asking the hygienist this. They're saying, you know, are all of my old fillings stealing my teeth well? Because I, you know, I need to answer this third question and I need to know the answer to that, right? How great is that if they ask you instead of you having to try to point out to them that they have a marginal defect, right? So creating ownership is really important. The truth of it is, there's nothing we can do as dental providers to manage someone's caries risk. They have to manage their caries risk. They have to make the conscious decision to choose to have us put fluoride varnish on in the office, and they have to do the home care pieces. So we really need them to have ownership around this. You know, probably one of the best things I've ever learned in dentistry is the difference between commitment and compliance. And you know, we talk all the time about wanting compliant patients. I actually don't want compliant patients because compliance is when we do something for someone else and compliance is always very, very short-lived. I want committed patients and committed team members and I'd like some committed children. Um, <laughs> so because when you're committed to something, it means you're doing it because you believe in it yourself. It's important to you. And, and that doesn't have a shelf life like compliance does, okay? So, the, you know, so I think about the fact that if they fill out their own caries risk assessment, there's a much higher chance that they're gonna get ownership around what's happening and then they can choose for themselves how they wanna manage that, okay? And so 
Um, people are asking about a camera assessment. So this camera assessment, you can download from the ADA um, if you're a member of the American Dental Association. If you live in the state of California, the CDA's got one on their website also. You can also get camera risk assessments from any of the dental manufacturers who sell preventive products. They all offer those, okay? So that's, that's pretty simple to do. Um, so e easy to get a copy of one of these forms. Okay. Now, you're going to run through a camera risk assessment, and the patient's going to be put in one of three boxes, low, moderate, high, carries risk. But the other thing that I love about the camera process is it actually lays out a recommended way to go through prevention. Okay. And so one of the things I want to be super clear about when we talk about carries is we don't prevent caries. I don't really like that word, right? We're going to help the patient manage their caries risk. And management, using that word is important because different people get managed at different levels. And I have some patients where we manage their caries risk so effectively, they do not get new cavities or caries lesions for a very extended period of time. I have other patients whose caries risk is high enough that even when we do everything we can think to do, they still get caries lesions or new cavities, but what we've done is we've decreased the frequency or the severity of those cavities. And that partly has to do with their caries risk individually. It has to do with what management strategies they choose for themselves and that they are committed to doing on an ongoing basis. But we really want to help people understand that this is about management. And management is something we have to do ongoingly. It doesn't eliminate the risk like you treat it once and it's gone. We got to continue to do it. So what are the things that Canberra says to do for patients who have an elevated caries risk? And we're going to go through these and we'll talk about these in sort of sequence, but this is kind of the whole list. And all the way down to recall frequency, that's part of the Canberra protocol. The very last one, which is tray bleaching, is not in the Canberra protocol. That's a Leanne Brady thing. It's actually a Van Haywood thing that I adopted. <laughs> um, but it's honestly probably about one of the best things I've ever done in my practice around caries management. So we're going to talk about that even though it's outside the Canberra protocol. So the very first thing at the top of the list is what we call prescription toothpastes. So I will tell you that they call these toothpastes because the idea originally was, well, people already brush their teeth. Now that is an assumption, but let's assume that if they're in our practices where we can do a caries risk assessment, at least once a day they're brushing their teeth. Okay. And we're going to put a medication on the toothbrush instead of over-the-counter toothpaste that has a much greater efficacy at preventing decay. But since we're not asking the patient to do anything new, we should have really, really good ongoing commitment. That was kind of the premise. Make it easy for patients. Find something we can fit into their existing regimen. So when we think about that, one of the things that I want to tell you is I learned pretty early on not to have patients replace their toothpaste with these medications. Number one, when I call these toothpastes, um, it gives people a false sense that this is just toothpaste like they can buy at the drugstore. And I want them to be really clear this isn't just toothpaste, that this is a very specific medicine that we're giving them to help manage their caries risk. The other thing is the truth is most of these don't taste like toothpaste. And when I actually said to my patients, you can use this instead of toothpaste, um, them using it six months down the road was really low. And the reason they all said to me is, my mouth didn't feel fresh. My mouth didn't taste fresh. It wasn't like toothpaste. And you know that taught me a lesson. So the way I instruct my patients to use this is I say to my patients, Brush and flush your teeth just like you always, you've always done. Use whatever toothpaste you want to buy from the grocery store or the drugstore. And after you're done, I want you to take a pea-sized amount of this medication. I want you to put it on your toothbrush, and I want you to use your toothbrush just to spread it around and make sure you really coat all of the surfaces of your teeth. And now the next part of the instructions is super important. 
They need to spit out the excess, but not rinse with water. And if they're doing it first thing in the morning, they need to not eat or drink for 10 minutes. They wanna keep this in the oral environment as much as possible for about 10 minutes. At night, what I say is spit out the excess and just go to bed. Now, my patients who have occlusal appliances, um, Essex retainers, um, clear orthodontic aligners, mandibular advancement devices, if they have any kind of a removable device, uh, I actually ask them to actually put this on the toothbrush and spread it on the device, on the inside of the device, and then put the device in and then go to bed. And so they're actually using their mandibular advancement device or whatever as kind of like a fluoride tray at night. And they're putting these products in there. So there are lots and lots of products like this um, that we can um, sell in our offices or that you can write a prescription for. Now, I personally dispense all of these products in my office. I do that. I don't charge a profit on it because I don't want to pay Arizona sales tax. So I sell it exactly for what I can buy it for. I dispense it because I don't want to put a barrier between the patient and using it. I want it to go home with them when they leave the office, not have to go see if CVS has it or however they're going to find it. So I, I see greater implementation because we dispense this stuff, but that's a personal choice. And you can certainly charge a profit if you want to. I just don't want to do any more tax forms and then I absolutely have to. So it's not worth the five bucks. When you think about the products in this category, and the way I think about all biomaterials, and I know many of you who know me and have heard me before know that I'm kind of a dental materials geek, uh, but the way I think about dental materials is I want to understand the mechanism of action of the active ingredients we use in dentistry. And that way I can pick up any box, any tube, any bottle. I can look at what the active ingredients are and I can tell you what it does do and doesn't do without having to read a marketing slick or go into the internet. That's just how I think about materials. In this category, prescription toothpastes, there are only two active ingredients you need to worry about. One is fluoride and the other is some form of calcium phosphate. There are three kinds of products. There are prescription strength fluoride, there are calcium phosphate, and there are fluoride and calcium phosphate in one tube. So what does fluoride do? And I know fluoride is almost a political conversation today. And even in dentistry, there are dental professionals who are becoming anti-fluoride. Personal preference aside, scientific data, what does fluoride do? Fluoride actually has four mechanisms of action. Primary mechanism of action of fluoride is conversion of enamel from hydroxyapatite to fluoroapatite, and fluoroapatite is more acid resistant. So it's much harder to dissolve fluoroapatite in an acidic pH. That's its primary mechanism of action. The secondary mechanism of action of fluoride is that it is antimicrobial. Now it's antimicrobial properties are dose dependent. Water is not antimicrobial with one part per million fluoride. Over-the-counter toothpaste is not antimicrobial. We're gonna talk briefly about silver diamine. Silver diamine is 46,000 parts per million of fluoride. Its primary mechanism of action is antimicrobial activity. Okay? Most of these products are gonna be between 900 and 5,000 parts per million in the tube. They all release about the same amount of fluoride, so they are mildly antimicrobial. The third mechanism of action of fluoride has to do with sensitivity. Fluoride is not a desensitizer by itself. When you combine fluoride with a metal ion, you can actually get a little crystal precipitate that blocks dental tubules and helps prevent root sensitivity. And the fourth mechanism of action of fluoride is that it increases the Vickers micro hardness of dentin. I have no idea if that means it doesn't dissolve in the presence of caries. Um, nobody's correlated those two things, but they will tell you that, that it increases the Vickers micro hardness of dentin. So why do we use prescription fluoride? The primary reason we use prescription strength dosing of fluoride is conversion of hydroxyapatite to fluoroapatite. We're strengthening the enamel and making the enamel more resistant to an acidic pH in the oral environment. Now, calcium phosphate. What does calcium phosphate do? Calcium phosphate, you would think, 
helps things remineralize. Intuitively, that sounds great. They can't put that on the tube because there's not enough scientific data for the FDA to allow them to do that. What does calcium phosphate do? Calcium phosphate is an easy to deliver, incredibly powerful buffering agent. It neutralizes the oral environment. And since the primary risk factor for caries is an acidic pH, if the patient's saliva won't buffer the oral environment, I want them putting something buffering in the oral environment. So we use calcium phosphate. So ClinPro 5000 is a 3M product. It is 5,000 parts per million of fluoride plus tri-calcium phosphate. Um, MI Paste and MI Paste 1 both come from GC America. The MI Paste 1 is newer. You may not be familiar with it. Um, it is more toothpaste-like than the original MI Paste. Original MI Paste is just calcium phosphate. When they add the plus, it's calcium phosphate plus fluoride, and MI Paste 1 is calcium phosphate plus fluoride. Prevident 5000 is just 5000 parts per million fluoride. Prevident 5000 plus also has calcium phosphate. Um, Voco makes their Remen products. Um, so there's, I mean, almost every manufacturer of um, preventive products has something in this space. And you need to figure out, is it fluoride? Is it calcium phosphate or is it both? Now, if I get to choose, I give people both. Why wouldn't I have two active ingredients with different mechanisms of action in one thing that the patient does? So my preference is to give them both. You know, I will just tell you personally, I dispense ClinPro 5000 and we do dispense the MI Pace products. Why do I keep more than one brand in my office? Patient preference, right? I want the patient to have the flavor they want the two companies make different flavors, the viscosity they want, right? Some people like one over the other. I just want it in their mouths. I don't want to have to argue with them about which one tastes better. So we give them lots of different options, okay? Um, and the mechanism of action of calcium phosphate is literally that it's just buffering. So you're taking something that's basic and putting it in an acidic environment. And so the pH, the total pH comes back to neutral. Okay. So it's not a very complicated mechanism of action. I, I am going to tell you, when, as, since we're talking about a lot of these medications and different products, I do ask all of my patients about um, food preferences and about allergies, right? And so the MI products from GC America, the calcium phosphate is actually more effective than the artificially generated calcium phosphate because it's something, it comes from casein which is a milk protein, okay? But you do need to be aware of that. And so I ask my patients, you know, are you allergic to milk? Do you have problems with dairy products? And even if they say, oh yeah, you know, I'm lactose intolerant. Well, there's no lactose in this. I don't send them home with something where on the tube it says part of it came from a milk product, right? I, you know, they don't necessarily think through that and I want them to know I heard them, okay? I also don't send them home those products if they say they're vegan. The last, if somebody's not wearing leather shoes, they're not going to brush their teeth with something that came from a milk product. Right? You might not have that where you live, but in Arizona, these are big issues. Okay? Um, I have patients who are gluten-free, either by preference or because they're truly celiac. Lots of our dental products have gluten in them. Um, and when we talk about fluoride varnish, a lot of fluoride varnish is made from tree nuts. And so you need to understand if your patient has a tree nut allergy. Okay. So again, good to know that we have lots of different brands, manufacturers, and they have different ingredient mixes. So you can find the one that works for your patients. If my patients are at moderate caries risk, I ask them to use these medications once a day, preferably at night before they go to sleep. If they're at high caries risk, I ask them to do it twice a day, morning and night. And in the morning, they need to not eat or drink or rinse their mouth for 10 minutes. Okay. So the next piece of the Canberra protocol is actually doing fluoride varnish, and I'm sorry, the word varnish after chlorhexidine got covered up by the photograph, um, but some kind of varnish in your office. So let's talk about varnish and what we're gonna do here in our practices. So fluoride varnish, by the way, if you're still using foam or gel, that is old technology, that's listening to eight track tapes, so you should let that go, okay? Varnish has a much, much higher efficacy 
it keeps the fluoride ion concentration elevated for four to six hours after application, foam and gel is less than 30 minutes. And the more hydroxy appetite you create, the better you're protecting what's happening in the oral environment. Um, two kinds of fluoride varnish on the market, um, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. The way we talk about that is there's varnishes that creep and varnishes that don't creep. How do you know which one you're using? If the instructions say to have the patient lick their teeth before you apply the varnish and only to paint it on the facial free gingival margin, it's hydrophilic and it creeps. If it says to dry the teeth thoroughly and coat the varnish over all of the surfaces of the teeth, it's hydrophobic and then it doesn't creep. Why do you care about those two things? Um, the ones that creep, since they only have to be painted on the facial, are much better from a patient tolerance perspective. They don't feel like they have sweaters all over their teeth. And they actually get into all the nooks and crannies down into the occlusal grooves through the inner proximal. And so the hydrophilic varnishes, you get 100% coating of, var of varnish over the surfaces of the tooth in under about two or three minutes. So they may probably just feel a little bit more friendly to the patient. Now I'm clear patients resist varnish because their teeth feel so awesome when the hygienist gets done. And then we're gonna paint this stuff on their teeth. I, I just tell my patients about it right on the front end. I just tell my patients, and I actually, you know, use an example that applies for me as a woman, but, I, but you know what? I tell my patients all the time, I said, you know, this would be like me going to my hairdresser. And one of the most fun things about my hairdresser is that when she gets done and, you know, they hand you the mirror and you get to spin around and you get to see your hair from 360 degrees and it looks fab. My hair never looks that good when I do it. I am not that talented. Okay. And I had this really, really awesome hairdo until I sleep on it or take a shower or whatever. So it'd be like, I pay $200 to get my hair done and she lets me look at it. And then she takes it and she just goes and messes the whole thing up and says, go home. That would really be annoying. Unless she told me if I let her mess up my hair, I would never go bald. I'd let her mess my hair up every single time. Okay. So we have to kind of just warn people on the front end that, you're gonna paint this stuff on their teeth. Their teeth are not gonna feel as fresh and clean as they just did at the end of the hygiene visit. But, but you're putting that medication on there on purpose to prevent them from getting cavities. In my practice right now, I will tell you upwards of 80% of my adult patients, we do a varnish application at their hygiene visits, okay? When I first started to recommend this, I didn't go to 80% the first time I talked to my patients about this. It took, six months, 12 months, 18 months to start to convert my patient population. No, I have not figured out how to get it paid for by an insurance company on adult. So my patients have to pay the, whatever we charge, $35, $40 for varnish application. Um, and part of how it happens is you explain it, you create ownership. Some people say, sure, let's do it. Some people say, nah, that's okay. And then the next time they come in, if they have a cavity, they go, what was that stuff you talked about? And sometimes they do it in the hygiene visit. More often, they ask me right after the injection, right? Now, didn't we talk about some stuff that I wouldn't get cavities? Yes. And then, by the way, I go right in and I update their next hygiene visit and make sure that that varnish code has been added to that appointment so that we don't have to remember it in three months or two months or, you know, that I had a conversation with them. Okay? And you convert your patients. And what's really interesting about management is patients ebb and flow. It's like working out. And I have patients who do fluoride varnish forever and then tell the hygienist, nah, I'm not going to do that because you know, I haven't had a cavity in forever. You kind of want to roll your eyes and go, duh, but that's inappropriate. Okay? Or they'll be in a hygiene chair and they'll have a new cavity. And I'll say to Connie or Angel, tell me what we're doing right now for prevention. And Connie or Angel very nicely will say, you know, we were doing X. But then at the last visit, we made the decision not to do varnish. I don't even have to say, oh, that would be a good idea. The patient will say, yeah, maybe we should do that today. Right? We just, we just kind of refresh their memory about those decisions. Now, I do want to talk about Servitec Plus. Servitec Plus is chlorhexidine varnish. 
Um, there is no competitive product. There's only one that's FDA approved in this country, and it's through Ivoclar Vivident. And chlorhexidine varnish is actually extremely common in other countries, in Canada and in Europe. Everybody on this uh, webinar knows what chlorhexidine does. It's an antimicrobial. It either kills the bacteria at a certain dosing or it prevents the bacteria from replicating so they can't produce new baby bacteria. And chlorhexidine rinse has always been part of the CAMBER protocol. So for high risk patients, the protocol originally said to give the patients Paradex or PerioGuard or PerioStat, have them rinse once a day for the first seven days of the month, take the rest of the month off, then start over next month. Not happening. Okay. Um, about a year ago or so, the ADA added chlorhexidine varnish into the Canberra protocol. Chlorhexidine varnish is one of my all-time favorite products. You've heard me talk about it if you've heard me talk about veneer provisionals or I use it for all sorts of stuff. It has a totally different mechanism of action of fluoride. And so my patients who are on ClinPro 5000 or MIPACE1 or some high prescription strength fluoride at home, I don't do fluoride varnish when they're off in the office because they've already got that mechanism of action. We'll do chlorhexidine varnish. So now we're going at this problem from two different directions. Uh, you use the same code as for fluoride varnish. It's actually very low viscosity. It's very patient friendly. It doesn't have a flavor. Same post-op directions. Um, and it's really incredible at preventing caries. That's what it's FDA approved for. And it actually reduces the quantity of s mutans in the oral environment for up to four months after application. It's not physically present that long, but it actually keeps the bacteria suppressed for that long. Right? So just wanna make sure we talk about chlorhexidine varnish. I mentioned silver diamine. Um, silver diamine, I think for most of us, is we're using as a caries arresting medicament, and it has its own ADA code for that. I don't use silver diamine as a preventive. We're not routinely applying it at hygiene because of the risk and the side effects. We apply it when there already is a carious lesion, and then it arrests that decay. But what I do want to just mention is if you do even one drop of silver diamine fluoride, you do not also do a fluoride varnish. It replaces fluoride varnish. Even if you only apply it in one spot, the, the presence of free radicals of fluoride in all of the saliva is high enough that you would not also do a fluoride varnish application at that hygiene visit. So we don't combine them. So you do one or the other. Um, and, um, and thank you, Darren. Yeah, there's no staining at all with the chlorhexidine varnish and there's also no bad flavor. It doesn't taste like chlorhexidine, okay? So let's talk just a little bit about xylitol. Also not part of the CAMBER protocol, but this always comes up. Hygienists ask me about this all the time and want to know about xylitol. So, you know, one of the good things about talking about xylitol is I don't think our patients realize that even artificial sweeteners can cause decay. So S-mutans can use all the artificial sweeteners except xylitol. Okay. Now, xylitol we like because not only can the bacteria not eat it, but at a high enough dose, it's caries preventive. The problem is that dose is five grams daily. That's 20 pieces of Trident chewing gum in one day. I mean, we're talking like Willy Wonka level chewing here. Okay. Um, and there's a couple other problems with this kind of dose of xylitol. So a couple of pieces of this. Um, a, xylitol is lethal to dogs. So if you have patients who like dogs, keeping xylitol around could be dangerous. A certain percentage of people have a very severe gastric response to xylitol that's unpleasant. So they can't tolerate xylitol. Okay. Um, if they can and xylitol doesn't upset their stomach and they don't have a problem with it, um, it's a great way to help people. One of the things to realize is a large number of your older patients who have high caries risk also have xerostomia or dry mouth. And one of the first things people do to treat themselves is start chewing gum, use hard candy, or use mints. And so now they have insufficient salivary flow, insufficient buffering capacity, and they're also bathing their mouth in sugar and often an acid pH if they do lemon or citrus flavored gum or candy. If we can at least get them onto xylitol versus based gums, mints, and candies, 
um, it would be really beneficial, okay? Other thing, if your patients ask you, 90 some percent of the xylitol in this country is genetically modified because it comes from genetically modified corn. If you have patients that are trying to avoid GMOs, um, you're gonna need to get them to buy the more expensive mints and candies from like a Whole Foods or a health food store that are GMO free, okay? Um, so, um, and I don't know if there's a different dosing for kids. I apologize. The pediatric portion of my patient population is teeny, teeny, and that's an area that I, I just don't invest a lot of time staying on top of it. Another alternative, by the way, are these, um, they're called LALs, and I get them from the same company that Elevate Oral Healthcare that sells silver diamine fluoride, sells Advantage or Rust. They make lollipops and hard candies. They're xylitol free, so if people respond to xylitol, these are safe. They actually taste really good. The active ingredient is triclosan. Triclosan is an antimicrobial, it's in Colgate toothpaste. So they're actually designed as a caries preventive and um, they're great for patients with dry mouth. And they make cherry and grape and lemon and orange and you can buy a box that's all one flavor or a mix and match. And you just sell the whole box with all the candies and the lollipops to your patients. The lollipops are designed for kids. So there's a handle so that they don't aspirate them versus giving them a, a hard candy, okay? All right, and then let's talk about tray bleaching. So I told you that um, this is not part of the Canberra protocol. But honestly, this is my all-time favorite caries preventive. I learned about this sort of by mistake. Um, and then I um, started using it in my practice. The mistake was I was researching for doing a lecture on bleaching. And I started coming across Van's work about using this for caries. I, you know, I will tell you that um, I, I can't believe he's been publishing this stuff for 35 years and so few of us know about it and so few of us are doing anything with us with it because it's so phenomenal. And I'll tell you the protocol. The protocol is simple. You're going to make your patients bleaching trays and trays that you've trimmed the material but left it covering the gingival tissues by at least a millimeter. So don't scallop the tray like you do for true bleaching. Make sure you're going to cover all of the gingival tissues. You're going to dispense 10% carbamide peroxide. No hydrogen peroxide formulas work for this. 10% carbamide peroxide, which is the lowest concentration of the active ingredient you can buy. And you're going to ask your patients to load the tray, put the trays in their mouth. And ideally, it'd be great if they wear the trays for 90 to 120 minutes. We know scientifically that this works and you get the impact of the carbamide peroxide in probably about 20 to 30 minutes, right? But tell them to wear it longer if you can. How often can they do it? I ask my patients to do it minimum once every 14 days. They can do it every night if they want to, right? So why do you want to not trim the trays at scallop them? You want to force this into the sulcus a little bit. Okay. The best way to make these trays is no block out material. Don't do a, like a suck down beforehand. You can't suck a tray down tight enough to prevent there from being space for this. And the looser the tray, the more saliva intrusion you get and the more gravitational loss of the material you get. So I don't ever block out when I do bleaching trays or caries trays. 10% um, carbamide peroxide will not cause sensitivity any way, shape, form, not possible. We used to send people home and say sleep in these for eight hours every night. So they can do it ad infinitum forever. And David Cook, they can absolutely sleep in them, no question. Okay. So they can wear them up to eight hours a day. They can do it every single day if they want to. Um, why does this work? Originally, Van thought it worked primarily because carbamide peroxide is the best deplacking agent on the planet. And so what the carbamide peroxide does is convert to hydrogen peroxide, and then the hydrogen and the oxygen molecules separate. And as they separate, it actually strips the biofilm, the pellicle off the surface of the tooth. And then the oxygen molecules will actually permeate the enamel and permeate the dentin. That's the bleaching capacity. They bind to the color particles and pull it right back out of the tooth, okay? But it's that stripping the pellicle and the biofilm that we thought was the primary mechanism of action because where do the bacteria live that cause caries and gingivitis? In the pellicle and the biofilm. 
Well, turns out at 15 years after Van started promoting this technique, we actually started getting more science and we also came to understand that carbamide peroxide is the most powerful buffering agent you can put in a patient's mouth. So when it converts to hydrogen peroxide, it also produces a byproduct called urea and that urea buffers the oral environment and you get significant long-term buffering after you've done a 10% carbamide peroxide treatment. By the way, don't tell your patients it produces urea. They'll recognize that word and it'll gross them out, okay? But that's actually the important mechanism of action. It's why hydrogen peroxide won't work. Because if you bleach with hydrogen peroxide, you don't produce urea, you don't get the buffering piece of this mechanism of action and hydrogen peroxide will cause sensitivity. It's a much stronger chemistry. So we're gonna use 10% carbamide peroxide. I will tell you, if my patients say to me, I'll do one thing, I'm only doing one thing, this would be the one for them to do. This is the most powerful. I have patients who have Sjogren's. I have patients who've had head and neck cancer, radiation, and have no salivary glands left. Um, who've done this protocol and gone from literally, I thought, I'm just paddling upstream until their dentures arrive, to they haven't had a carious lesion in five years. It's an incredibly powerful carious preventive if patients will do it. And the good news is, what do you think motivates them to do it? Their teeth look whiter, their teeth look cleaner, their teeth feel cleaner. So it's really super effective. Um, somebody asks, what's the youngest person I would do this on? Um, I will tell you that's a personal decision, but I've done this as young as young teenagers. So 12, I think probably is the youngest person I've done it on. Um, if they're still growing and still losing baby teeth, the trays are going to stop fitting so fast. It can be an economic problem for mom and dad. Um, but remember, glyoxide. 10% carbamide peroxide, they sell it over the counter in the drugstore. Um, and any introduction of carbamide peroxide would be helpful, okay? Um, I will tell you, I don't do this and I don't give any bleaching products to anyone who's pregnant because we've never studied it. We don't know what pregnancy category it is. Um, and if you've got patients who have a lot of cosmetic dentistry, they shouldn't do it eight hours every night days and days and days in a row, or you'll create a color change. If they're doing it once every 14 days um, and they're only doing it for two hours, you're not going to get enough significant bleaching so that you can actually create a color shift problem. Okay. So, um, and this works whether it's enamel based caries, dentin based caries, or any of the others. Okay. So, hey, with that, Darren, yeah, turn your mic on and we'll do some questions. I was just going to tell you so, uh, uh, there was a question about perio protect trays by a few people. I looked it up. That's hydrogen peroxide. So, that is different. Yeah. So, yeah, the tray fabrication is very similar. Um, but um, the, you know, what, what perio for perio patients, what you're trying to do is strip the pellicle and the biofilm, um, and you don't need buffering because it's a different cause. Now, this protocol will work for gingivitis and for caries. Their protocol won't work for caries. And can it bleach the gums is a good question. You know what, at 10% carbamide peroxide, I have never seen that happen, even wearing the trays for eight hours. And that's why we wanna do 10% carbamide peroxide. We don't want them to develop sensitivity, they'll stop. We don't want them to bleach their gums, they'll stop. We need to do something that's gentle enough. They can do it basically for the rest of their lives because their carriage risk isn't gonna shift. And is there a minimum amount of time per wearing that you get an effective like what's the least amount of time they can wear it and still get some, something good out of it? Yeah, great question. So it takes about 15 or 20 minutes to strip the pellicle and the biofilm. If they really want good buffering capacity, they need to do it for about 90 to 120 minutes. And the minimum to me is once every 14 days. And, and I can tell you that just clinical experience. I have patients who, I mean, most of my patients when we start do it all the time because they like the bleaching in the beginning. And then as a maintenance protocol, they do it once a week or once every two weeks for a couple hours, and it seems to work just fine. We, we found it to be just great with our um, azurostomia patients. That, that's 
it's been the one thing that seems to have tipped the scale on where we've done everything else. So um, I'm a big fan of that. Thank you to Van. Uh, yeah. Question that came up also was if you're having a patient put uh, any of those uh, prescription fluoride toothpaste in their nighttime appliances, mm -hmm. does it in any way degrade the acrylic or whatever it's made out of? No, not that I've ever seen, and I've been doing it for years and years. Um, and what is interesting, though, when you think about that acrylic, is if you're doing, if you've got your patients in like Invisalign trays or methacrylate aligners or Essex retainers or occlusal appliances, if they start to turn a funky yellow color, that's indicative of GERD. That's actually from stomach acid. Um, so if you see that, where you get that weird amber color coming into the trays, um, that's a patient you should definitely be asking about reflux. And by the way, for sure, put them, have them put something with calcium phosphate in that tray um, to protect the teeth. And then um, any, wait, what is this? Sorry. Oh, but by over the counter, no. The, the carbon peroxide, you cannot get it over the counter, correct? No, you can get glyoxide over the counter, but it's a liquid. And the problem is because of the viscosity, it won't stay in the trays long enough to give you the buffering capacity. So I definitely um, recommend you that you buy it and dispense it. And we buy, there's a lot of companies that make a 10% carbon peroxide. Um, we buy the refill boxes that don't have the retainer case and the suck down material. And then we just sell our patients the tubes. Yeah, we do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, you can do this, by the way. Um, I can never remember the name of the material. But if you, if you go to Van Haywood's website, okay, number one, you can download all of his peer-reviewed science on this technique. Uh, but number two, he has the name of a material, a thermoplastic material that you can actually make these trays for kids who were in bracket wire orthodontics. And you just show mom and dad how to heat the tray up once a week before they do it, reform the tray so it fits over the new tooth position. And you can do this even with kids in brackets and wires. And I just posted his website. Oh, good, thank you. Yeah, so, and by the way, because if you Google him, you're probably gonna find his son. <laughs> So, yes, he, you know, as famous as he is, he now has a son who is more famous than he is, so. So there's a very important question. Um, hey, Dr. Lee, I'm a big fan of your lectures. Where can I follow your courses? Um, that's a great question. Well, the first place, obviously, is the Panky Institute. Um, so I, you know, as the uh, director of education, and I teach in all the essentials, one, our four lecture courses, we're actually launching um, online education, um, like extended programs beyond these webinars, starting in the beginning of June. So um, you can just go to um, panky.org or pankygram.org to find all of that. 